I don't know about you, but I certainly feel like God's already been speaking so, so much this evening as we've been together. So I just want to open up in prayer as I begin. So Lord, I just thank you, Lord, for this amazing and incredible body of people. Lord God, your bride here in this place. And Lord, we, we know, Lord God, that unless you move, Lord God, and unless you work and unless you operate, Lord, we have nothing to give, Lord God, to those around us, Lord God. So I just pray as well tonight, Lord, that, uh, that you would speak, Lord God, because unless you're speaking, I've got nothing to share, Lord God. So we want to hear clearly anything that you want to say, Lord Jesus. So may we have open ears and receptive hearts to whatever you want to share tonight, Father. In Jesus' name, Lord. I mean, amen. So, okay, it's always such a privilege to be able to join you guys here at Kent Street. So thank you so much for inviting me to join you. Um, I've just got to say firstly that you're such a warm and welcoming body of people. Nobody could come to this body, here, to this church, and fail to be touched by the love of God. It's, it's a beautiful place. And it's great to see Liz as well. It's been nine years, I think, since I saw Liz in Romania. But, um, yep, yeah, so firstly, I just want to give you a brief update as to how things are going in Macedonia. Um, so, whilst in Britain and in the West, uh, during the pandemic, then there's been a lot of outreach online and through social media and things like that, which has led to a lot of new engagement with the church and with the message of the gospel. That hasn't been the case in Macedonia. So, it's been actually the opposite in Macedonia. There's been about, uh, speaking to various different church leaders over there, roughly a 50 to 60 percent drop in church engagement um, so there's about two million people live in Macedonia and there's about three and a half to four thousand people who belong to evangelical churches and that is a huge drop uh, probably for a whole variety of different reasons but just like with Jesus's ministry when people walked away from him it doesn't change the heart of the father his heart always remains the same just as Debbie was saying before he is God and he is good. His heart is to see his kingdom coming. His heart is for continued outreach. His heart is for salvation and for his love to be poured out upon people, whoever they may be. So, and God wants us to do that with an expectancy. God wants us to follow him with an expectancy that we will see him move in and through us, in our communities, amongst our neighbors, in our workplaces, in our families, wherever that is. Help us, Lord, to be expectant for what you want to do. So, um, we continue to do a variety of different things over in Macedonia. We're going through the Bible every weekday. We're going to start in September with a new Bible study, which is exciting. I'm really excited about that. As a team, we're looking at setting up a new house group as well and we continue to do evangelism amongst our neighbors on the streets although at this time of year it looks quite different because usually by 12 o'clock in the afternoon it's about 40 to 42 degrees so <laughs> you will very rarely find anybody out on the streets in Macedonia the parks will be absolutely empty even the main city park in Skopje will be empty except for yourself if you're there but in the evening, the place comes alive. It's amazing. I absolutely love it. You can walk past a coffee shop at 10 p.m. at night, and it will be full, not just with young adults. You'll have every age group. You'll have the older generations. You'll have parents there with four-year-old kids there at the coffee shops. It's such an amazing aspect of the culture, um, which I don't, I don't, uh, I'm not particularly a fan of the 42 degrees, but I am a fan of the coffee culture, so that's really good. So a couple of weeks ago as well, we saw a lady called Valentina come to Christ, which was amazing. We'd been speaking to her for several months, and um, life over there is very relational in Macedonia. It's, it's the, even though we are engaged in, on the streets evangelism and things like that, generally when people hear that you're a part of a Protestant church, it can very quickly turn them off because over there they view people as part of a Protestant church as belonging to a sect. So if it's almost like how we might see the Jehovah's Witnesses or the Mormons, something like that. If they hear you're part of a Protestant church, it's like, oh no, oh, sort of thing. So trying to get past that barrier can take quite a while with people. Building up those relationships with them, helping them to see that you're not some just strange weirdo or anything like that. 
Um, it's actually classified over there. If you belong to a Protestant church, they call you the new religion. So we, they have a term for us. Um, but God works through all, doesn't he? God works through amazing things. Um, and we're able to see as a house of prayer, we're continuing to meet every week. We're looking at getting our own building as well in the near future, which is really good. Pressing into God to see that transformation, not just within Skopje and within Macedonia, but how we build and network and interweave with the other nations of the Balkans to see the reconciliation uh, with all the different ethnic groups that are over there and to see that coming together after, well, the, the torrid history that they've had in the Balkans with Yugoslavia and things like that. So just like the Lord Jesus said, he said, don't despise the day of small beginnings. I don't know about you, but that scripture is often a check on me. Where am I thinking, why isn't so much more happening? And the Lord's saying, no, what did I say in my word? The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. Now it might be to start off as the smallest of seeds. Actually look at what it grows into when he moves through his spirit. And it's incredible to actually be a part of that. And what a privilege is it that actually God calls us to partner with him in his work, the work of his kingdom. It just sort of, it's mind-blowing really, isn't it, when you think that the God of the universe is actually pointing at you and saying, come, come to me, I've got something for you to do. So looking at this, um, I first want to ask, don't you just think that life with Christ is an adventure? It is an adventure. When we are full on going for Jesus, there is nothing about being a Christian that is boring. Nothing. Absolutely not. But when we start to ask for the details of what adventure might look like, that's when we start to become a bit more uncomfortable, don't we? Because we realize, oh, this is going to be a bit harder than I thought it would be. There's going to be more challenges here than I thought it would be. I'm going to feel a bit more pressed in on every side. Maybe the heat is going to be turned up. It's going to be getting a bit more uncomfortable. And that's when we start to go, I'm not sure about this. But actually, God's saying, you know, whatever you might face, the prize is worth the price. Amen. The prize is always worth the price. <clears throat> and it's into this that I really want to speak this evening. Um, so I've titled this message, Do You See What I See? And I'm sure there's a song that's after that. <laughs> So it's important as we journey with Christ that we, st that we come to increasingly see life and our lives in alignment with how does God see them? How does God see who we are and what he's called us to be? And the first scripture I actually want to read from is Deuteronomy chapter 1, starting from verses 6 to 8. And this is God talking to Israel as they're at the mountain of Horeb. It says, The Lord our God said to us at Horeb, you have stayed long enough at this mountain. Break camp and advance into the hill country of the Amorites. Go to all the neighboring peoples of the Arabah, in the mountains, in the western foothills, in the Negev and along the coast, to the land of the Canaanites and to Lebanon as far as the great river, the Euphrates. See, I have given you this land. Go in and take possession of the land the Lord swore he would give to your fathers to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and to their descendants after them. So this is taking place after God has delivered Israel from slavery in Egypt. He's been leading them on their journey to the Promised Land. He's led them through the Red Sea. And here at Horeb, they've been parked up for a while. They've been here for a little while. But from what the Lord has been saying here in this passage, we can see that he is seeing a number of different things. Firstly, he saw that the people of Israel had been at this mountain, been here long enough, it's time to move. He saw his covenant with them and the promises that he had made to them through their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he saw that they need, needed to go in and take possession of it. That is reality as God saw it. And let's face it, that's the only reality that really matters is how God sees it however much we might feel or think. <laughs> Do you think that is what the people of Israel saw? Do you think that was their mentality? That was their mindset? If we read on and look a little further into the chapter, we can read in verses 26 to 28, this is Moses saying to the children of Israel, but you were unwilling to go up 
You rebelled against the command of the Lord your God. You grumbled in your tents and said, the Lord hates us. So he brought us out of Egypt to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us. Where can we go? Our brothers have made our hearts melt in fear. They say, the people are stronger and taller than we are. The cities are large with walls up to the sky. We even saw the Anakites there. If you read earlier in the chapter, you will find that Israel had sent 12 spies into the land. But only two of them, Joshua and Caleb, come back with a positive report. The other 10 come back and spread fear and doubt in the camp and say, it might be great over there, but look at what you're going to have to face. We're all going to die if we go over there. They saw their circumstances through their earthly mindset. Instead of remembering the spiritual covenant that they were in with the Lord. That the God and Lord of all creation who had delivered them out of slavery in Egypt using mighty demonstrations of power was now going to just give up on them, abandon them, let them face their enemies on their own. In fact, as it even said in the scripture, their view was that the Lord must hate them because of what they were now facing. How deceived were they in their hearts for believing this? How after everything they could doubt the love of God towards them. Now we can read this and just think about this is Israel's response here. But in reality, how often do you and I think along the same lines? We face challenges in life and instead of responding in faith, we respond with, the Lord must have given up on me. Or the Lord must have wants me to die or he wants me to suffer or whatever it is. But that's never how God sees things. He never sees things like that. So we need to go in and unpack both how God and Israel sees the situation so that we can ask ourselves the question about who we are and what God has called us to. To do that, we need to look right at the end of those, cha- uh, of those se- uh, sections of scripture there that I just read. Firstly, God says here, see, I have given you this land. Go in and take possession of the land the Lord swore he would give to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and to their descendants after them. What is God referring to here? He's referring to the eternal covenant that he had made with Israel through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And because of all that, Israel is in complete covenant with him. When we look at how we relate to the Lord and what he asks us to do, we need to remember that we are in covenant with him because of what Jesus did at the cross for us, as has already been said and shared this evening. I think when we think of that covenant with God, we often fail to grasp the magnitude of what that means. What does it mean to be in covenant with God? When we think of the marriage covenant, What is that? It's about the bride and the groom making a lifelong commitment to each other that they would no longer be two parties, but one. That is exactly the same in our relationship with God. We obviously don't become God, but we are united with him in Christ. He is completely committed to us. He will never leave us and never forsake us. He says that he is the author and the perfecter of our faith. He says that we are now seated with him in heavenly places. That our identity is not in who the world says we are, but in who he says we are. Israel's identity was not based upon what the other nations that they would face thought of them. It's on what God thought of them, who he said they were. So my first question for us to meditate on is how often do we just take time to remember and to meditate on the fact that we're in covenant with God and that we're united with him, to enjoy being in his presence and being able, as has been shared earlier, to draw close to him with boldness and confidence? And do we allow that to grow our faith when God asks us to do something? Let's look at another scripture, David and Goliath. I'm sure we're all aware of, what, of the story. We know the story. 
the Philistines were attacking Israel. Their armies were facing off each other. But the Israelites were terrified of Goliath. What they could see in this situation was their physical weakness against someone as physically strong as Goliath. What was David's response, though? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Yeah, amen, amen. The physical stature of David and the Israelites didn't change. They were exactly the same. They didn't get any stronger in and of themselves. But what David was declaring and reminding Israel of was who was fighting for them. God was fighting for them. And if God is with you, who could be against you? Even someone as tall and mighty as Goliath. It's nothing to God, is it? They belonged to God, and he was fighting for them. If you take another element of uh, covenant, what we can see in Scripture, and the magnitude of it, look at Abraham and Sarah, how they began their journey as Abraham and Sarah, and how God took letters of his own name and merged them into their names to become Abraham and Sarah. How incredible is that? When we think of it in the same way for us, where he says, you have a seal above you, promised seal of the Holy Spirit, who is a guarantee of what is to come. How incredible that the king of the universe should give you a seal over your life, over your heart, over your spirit, over my spirit. It's incredible. Covenant with God is always the starting point. Always the starting point. What we get to do comes as the result of that. We don't try and earn our way to God. Rather, what we do comes from a place of already being in relationship with God. So going back to God's instructions to Israel at Horeb, what is the next thing we can look at? He tells them that they've been at this mountain long enough. So this wasn't a place of slavery to sin because they'd already left Egypt, but they'd been caught up at a mountain and they'd been there long enough. To us, in this context, mountains can be representative of the things that are hindrances in our walk with God, things that get in the way of us taking a hold of all that he has in store for us. Now, we know that life is a journey, and it will never be the case of, I've dealt with one thing, therefore I'll never have any issues in the rest of my life. It's always an ongoing process, an ongoing journey. We deal with one thing further on down the line, God challenges us about something else. We have to deal with something else. And so many of these things that we have to work through can stem and be rooted in past experience, maybe hurts where we need to process and forgive, maybe grief, or it could be maybe different things that our culture or the mindset of the world has spoken into us that needs correction. A big mountain for me on a personal level was going to another country that, even on holiday, that didn't primarily speak English. So that was a big, big no-no for me, and it was all rooted in fear. Not because I wouldn't want to go to these countries and experience their cultures and engage with the people, but it was the thought of being in a situation where I felt I couldn't communicate with them. If the language was an issue, it would terrify me. But back in 2015, the company that I was working for at the time sent me to their offices in the Netherlands because they wanted me to go and do some analysis work for them. And I was quite nervous about it, but because I thought, oh, well, they've they've dotted all the I's and they've crossed all the T's, and I thought, well, they they should have a good grasp of English. Well, they should have, as the company is sending me there. Then I should be fine. But how often do our plans ever go as we expect them to. So my plane was late leaving Liverpool Airport, which I was communicating this to my boss back in Warrington. I failed to realize, however, that that information was not being communicated to the guys in the Netherlands at the time. So when my plane landed in the Netherlands, in Amsterdam, there was no one there to pick me up. And I could just, as soon as I realized this, I could feel the panic start to rise up within me. Because what we know about fear is that it's so often irrational. It doesn't make sense. The rational thought would be, well, it's the Netherlands. 
there must be quite a few people who speak English here who'd be able to resolve the situation for you. In my mind at the time, I was there thinking, they speak Dutch, I speak English, what am I going to do? It was just panic that was rising up within me to the extent that I was contacting my boss back in Warrington and saying, if you don't get this sorted in the next 30 minutes, I'm jumping on the next plane back to England. <laughs> so, thankfully, there were no more hiccups on that trip. But it did highlight to me, on a personal level, just how crippling fear could be. How it hinders the walk that God has called you to. <clears throat> and it was not long after that God basically started to challenge me on that. He'd been telling me, You've allowed this mountain to be in your life too long. You've been going around this mountain for too long. And that I needed to take certain steps forward so that I could be positioned to then move forward in my relationship with him. So I took several steps in going, going abroad on my own, spent several weeks in Austria, spent seven weeks in Israel. And now I live in Macedonia. If you would have told me five years ago what I'm doing now, I would have thought you were having a giraffe. I would think, no, you're having a laugh here. You're speaking about somebody else. That can't possibly be me. And it's the same for each of us. Each of us have challenges in life that God touches upon and says, come on, we need to deal about this. We need to deal with it. We need to move forward. But when God challenges or disciplines us about something, it's not because, as Israel thought at the time, the Lord must hate us. It's the complete opposite. It's because he loves us. He's so committed to us. He sees what is hindering us and he wants to get it dealt with so we can move forward in Jesus, so we can move forward in everything that he has in store for us. A bird that constantly stays in the nest will never learn to fly. It will never learn to soar like the Lord created it to. We were created in that way to soar with Christ, to be his representatives, to wear that royal robe, knowing the blood of Christ over our lives, knowing the wholeness and the healing that comes from being in relationship with him, knowing his testimony at work through our lives. We weren't created to be held back from the, from the things that he has in store for us. The writer of Hebrews explains it like this in chapter 12, verses 1 to 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run the race with perseverance marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, who is the pioneer and the perfecter of faith. So my question is, what are the mountains in our lives, in our heart that God is maybe asking us to leave behind? We will often find that there are many things, either mindsets, hurts, false comforts, whatever, etc., that the Lord is telling us to leave behind and come into alignment with what he says. What are the things the Lord is maybe convicting you of? Telling you, come on, I have something better for you than this. I have something greater for you to step into. Leave this fear behind. Leave this worry. Leave this addiction. Leave this whatever it is. Leave this, this grief behind this hurt, this unforgiveness, leave it behind. Leave it at the cross. And what are the steps that you and I can take to leave those mountains behind? Pray about it. Read his word into it. Process it with your spouse or with other close brothers and sisters in Christ. God never calls us to live life on our own. It's with him and with his body. So let's grow together in Christ and let's move forward together in Christ. <coughs> Going on from this, what's the last point that I want to look at from what God said to Israel? Break camp and advance into the hill country of the Amorites. Go to all the neighboring peoples in the Arabah, in the mountains, in the western foothills, in the Negev, and along the coast, to the land of the Canaanites and to Lebanon as far as the great river, the Euphrates. See, I have given you this land. Amen. Do we realize that the Lord has land for each of us that he's calling us to advance and take possession of, metaphorically speaking? What is it? It's the Great Commission. What's the land of this country he calls us to take for his kingdom? The land of Latchford, Warrington, Cheshire, 
and beyond our families, our workplaces. He calls us to press in. He calls us to pray. He calls us to intercede. He calls us to declare. He calls us to speak. He wants us to take ground for his kingdom. It says in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 to 20, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. That is not just the calling for a few select people. That is the calling for each and every single one of us as followers of Christ. God doesn't have favorites. He doesn't see the woods. Sorry, I see the wood for the trees. He sees the trees. Let me get that analogy right. Yeah, he sees each of us. His heart is for each of us. His calling is irrevocable. The covenant he made with us is irrevocable. It doesn't matter what your past is. It doesn't matter what you think of your current situation. God is for you, and his calling remains on you and on me. God sees where we're going not what we've left behind. He sees the promised land, not Egypt. When we think of ministry, we can often think of a number of different things. We might think of an organization or people within the church who maybe have been elevated in our perceptions to some sort of celebrity status, maybe well-known evangelists or teachers or whatever. But that's not the case when we look at scripture. Each of us have a ministry. Each of us have a ministry. And Christ is calling us to play an active role and part in the Great Commission. As we heard earlier on, call of the Great Commission is for each of us. There are many different roles within the bride, but each one is vital for the building up of the body and the advancement of his kingdom. Some of us can often think, I'm not as gifted as that person, or my role isn't as important that's not true you're vital for the kingdom i'm vital for the kingdom for the body of christ the body would be far lesser if you were not in it if i was not in it that's how god sees it this is for the building up of the body how incredible is that what are the dreams that god has placed within you what are the passions he has placed within you what particular aspect of God's kingdom excites you the most? What is your gifting? Because you are gifted. Each of us are gifted. The Holy Spirit gifts each one of us. He isn't selective in how he does that. He doesn't say, I'm going to give this person a gift, but that person, mm, no, I'm not sure. I'll leave that person till the, till the end. No, each one of us, he has gifted various different things. And he enjoys us. Do you know that he doesn't just tolerate us? He enjoys us. So where he calls us to partner with him, where he calls us to take his message and to advance the kingdom, he enjoys us partnering with him in that. If he didn't, he wouldn't ask us. God is God, and he is capable of doing anything he wants without our help. But he says, no, I want you to partner with me. So let's not allow ourselves to think that we can't do anything. There are so many things that we can either be involved in, in pioneering, or things that are going on already that we can join in with and be developing alongside. What about the prayer ministry? What about reaching your neighbors or work colleagues? Maybe you have a heart to reach the business world. Maybe you have a heart for children's ministry. Maybe you have a heart to open up your home for a house group. Maybe you are musically gifted and want to join the music team. There are so many areas. It's not like one list that says 99 things on this list. There's anything you can be involved in for the kingdom of God. So to sum up, what are my questions that I want us to go away with and think about and to process? Who does God say he is to you? Who does, what does God say about you in his word? Write it down. Remind yourself of it. Just thinking of 
God said to the prophet, I think it's Habakkuk, write it down on stone tablets. Think about, meditate upon who is God and who does he say I am. Not what the world says, not based upon past hurts or past experiences, upon his word, because his word is, is true and he is faithful in everything that he does. Allow it to inform the choices you make. Let's not allow ourselves to be held back by fear or doubt or anything like that. And it's a lifelong journey. We all face these questions on a daily basis, don't we? But let's grow as we grow in Christ. Let's be sober-minded, actively taking a hold of Christ. As Paul said, one thing I, I let go of what's behind me, I press on to take hold of Christ Jesus. Have you got anything in your life, a mountain that the Lord has been highlighting to you and asking you to trust him and take those steps to move forward from? If he's challenging you about something, be reminded that's because he loves you. And though it might feel scary to actually leave the mountain behind because you might be going into something that's unexpected or unknown, if God has called you to leave behind, it's because what he sees is far, far better than the mountain that you're currently walking around. And that's the same for me. I know that the Lord challenges me on a regular basis about various mountains in my life. The one about going to the Netherlands, I must admit, was a slightly scary one for me. But as God takes us on a journey, we see him work. We see him move in our lives. And that's not something that's passive or mediocre. That's not something that's... Eh, when we get to the end, we go, wow, God, what, you do, what did you do here? God, how did you change my heart in this situation? How did you, not necessarily always looking at changing our circumstances, but changing our perception of our circumstances, changing our heart attitude towards them? Number three, what are your passions? What are your dreams? What is your gifting? Where can you be involved in the Great Commission? What is the ground that God is calling you to take possession of? And to be reminded in that, that he doesn't call you to do it on your own, but that he is your strength and that you are part of his body. So as we go on from here, let's be reminded who we are in Christ. Let's be reminded that whatever we might face in our situations or circumstances, whatever we may think or our perceptions are of what other people think of us, all that matters is what God thinks of us. Yeah, what God thinks of us. How he defines our mountains, and he says, let it go. I've got something better for you. And then, what is the promised land from our metaphorical standpoint? Is he asking us to take? Is he asking us to grab a hold of? Where is he asking us to step out in faith? In whatever element or realm that looks like. Thank you very much. Thank you.